Test, test, test. Okay, so welcome to day four um, of Geostat. Uh, this is going, I'm going to run two blocks now uh, on uh, visualization of spatial and spatial temporal data using the package called uh, uh, PlotKML. And I will do, first I will do about one hour, I will just introduce you to all the complexities and um, all the um, um, theoretical uh, concepts and aspects that one has to consider when um, he or she decides to try to develop a, like a, a, a software for visualization of space-time data. Uh, so I will, I will tell a story what actually happened to me, and, uh, and then we are going to uh, try to run a tutorial. Where, so there's a script, so you don't have to invent the code yourself. Uh, so we'll try to run that tutorial. And then in the second block also, by on the end of the block, I will also look at the uh, data set we are, that we are using in a spatial prediction competition game. So uh, we will look also at that data set and we'll see how we can visualize it. But in that case, I'm, I'm not going to give you code because I'm always, of course, I will try to make it as hard as possible for you for the competition game. Uh, so because I want to see, I want to see that you put some effort and that you um, get get into really coding and and looking at the data and so on. Uh, so there are a few things here uh, I should mention before I start talking. So there is a a paper on PlotKML uh, written for Journal of Statistical Software, and this paper it's a it's a preprint, so it's paper is still not on the journal website. But I've been waiting now maybe three four months. Uh, so the review has finished and now the paper is in the process and I was hoping that the special issue will be released uh, by the beginning of the Geostat, but it hasn't been released. So then I was thinking, okay, what do I do? And I decided just to put a preprint so you can read the paper. And paper has mo most of the stuff that I'll be uh, talking about and showing. So most of the stuff is really explained in detail in that paper. And of course there are uh, there are many uh, code examples, and so you can you can look at the paper, and you can already refer to that paper if you use the package. Of course, you can just cite cite that paper, or if you see something interesting in that paper. Also, my slides are just um, uh, my slides on the plot KML can be found also from the. Uh, PlotKML homepage. So if you go to, if you follow the link, PlotKML. Okay, then you get to the PlotKML homepage. Also, if you cannot find the link, if you just do PlotKML, if you Google PlotKML, you will get to the PlotKML homepage, and and here are my slides. So this is the slides I'm going to run first. So this package is, is uh, uh, made and maintained by a group of people. Uh, so most of code, I did the most of code development, of course, but there is also a uh, big contribution by Pierre, Dylan, and, and Ezer also joined us in the um, later phase, and so he also helped us uh, clean up a bit and organize things in a better way. So the uh, the Package is uh, plot camera is a package for uh, visualization of uh, spatial and spatial temporal data, but I also call it a package for scientific visualization because you can also visualize, for example, a regression plot. You can put a regression plot in Google Earth and you can visualize it. You could put the points from a regression plot. You can put a line, and if you have a, like a three-dimensional regression, then you could visualize the three-dimensional points or a surface that you fit through the points. So that's all possible in Google Earth. So that's why I call it a scientific visualization. So it, it, it's, it goes beyond just a visualization of geographical phenomena. But I don't have examples with like regression plots and things, but it, they could be, they, this could be created uh, also with this package probably quite uh, easily. No big screen. Mm. 
Okay, so here are my slides. Okay, so plotkml is a, is a R package, and um, the main thing what it does is uh, basically it writes the SP class objects and space, time, and raster uh, class object, but also it plots some trajectory type objects. It, it plots them directly, so you go directly from R to Google Earth, so that's kind of the, it's a very actually simple concept, so you know, you want to, we have a, a geographical or uh, spatial, spatial temporal data, and you want to get quickly into Google Earth. And I also, I mean, because I have a GIS background, I also tried uh, to program it in a way that you create kind of cart what they call a cartographically correct. Cartographically correct is, for example, if you use colors, then you want to see a legend. Um, if you if you use if you use uh, different graphical elements, so you you want to use them so they are very efficient. So when somebody looks at those maps that they can quickly read and see what's going on. So as I said, there's the paper on PlotKML, so if you are interested in more detail. And that was a, my small contribution to the R community. Um, about three years ago, I was, I was looking at this triangle and I said, wow, I really I, I'm a big fan of Google Earth and I'm a big fan of open source uh, GIS and I, of course I'm a big fan of R. So, uh, so, but I, I said in this triangle, there's one thing that wasn't so well established, and that was the going from R to Google Earth. So I, I felt like um, there's a big potential there, and uh, so then I started thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I could make a package. I started making some functions, and then actually Pierre, Pierre Rudir, he works at the uh, Land Care uh, Research at uh, New Zealand, so it's a government agency in New Zealand. Um, and so he told me, oh, you should make a package. I said, oh, well, I don't know, I never made a package, probably it's very complicated. And it, it is just, anybody made the R package here? Yes, one, two. So it can be, it can be s uh, simple if you, well, it depends on your ambitions. So if you say, well, I just want to make few functions and I want to have them documented and I want, I want to, you know, have something very focused, then you can get it quickly done. But if you're a bit more ambitious, and I turn out that I was quite ambitious with this, if you're a bit more ambitious, then uh, then it, it it will take some time. I mean, it it's, it takes a really careful preparation, and and then you you can see that there's this growing complexity. And then if you make something generic and people start using it, then there are bugs, and then you get all this, you get stress. You know, people writing your stuff. Hey, I tried this, doesn't work, and you feel responsible. And so it's it's, it's a really bit different story. But uh, nevertheless, I think I, I, I managed to implement most of the stuff I wanted. So from, from my side, I did most of the things I implemented, like 90% that I originally imagined about three years ago. So I, I, I think I managed to implement most of the things. And now it's just uh, boils down to improving and optimizing and uh, making it run faster, making it run with big data, so that these are still open issues that I have to solve. So I have to also have a, a bit of a disclaimer here. So if you start using plot KML and if you have a big data and if you want to go beyond, there might be there are still bugs and there might be problems. And so like with any open source, so uh, if you discover one, please send it to me via the RCG, of course. Then you can, if if it's a something uh, really specific, you can send me with a direct email. If you think it's something of interest to the whole community, then please send it via the RCG. Uh, so PlotKML, as you see from the title, what PlotKML does, what I first originally have the, my first idea was that in the SP package, you have a, a plotting function which is called SP plot. So that's a plotting of spatial data. And then I was thinking I, I want to just, I, uh, eventually I wanted to make a one function in the package and uh, so that would be a plot in Google Earth function. And because uh, the way you plot in Google Earth is that you uh, create KML files, because that's your uh, standard format for uh, data in Google Earth. So then, the, hence the name of the package is plot KML. So you plot a KML file. Um, you actually plot via a KML file. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the KML, but it's a kind, it's a type of a XML. Um, 
It was um, made by a small uh, company, which was later on bought by Google. And, and you know that they, f they further on developed uh, Google Earth. And so that's, uh, that was the uh, uh, sch uh, sch uh, schema uh, officially, it's still schema officially used by Google Earth. And there's a now, the recent version, I don't know if there's a, there has been an update, uh, but last time I checked the recent version of KML was 2.2. There is a KML reference manual, of course, you can look at all the uh, elements of the uh, KML. And uh, often people ask, you know, why do you develop things for uh, Google Earth? And so uh, many, many people identify my package with uh, Google Earth. So say, oh, you like make a package for Google Earth? No, I mean, plot KML is independent on Google Earth, of course. Um, and it, it's not a Google Earth plugin or anything. It's just a software to make KMLs. And now in your system, when uh, plot KML finishes, then it has the last function, which it calls is a KML open. And then in this function, it will call uh, whatever is the official reader for KML files. And most of us, I think, maybe probably 100%, we will have a Google Earth as the official uh, browser of the KML file. But if you want to use some other browser that you can remove Google Earth and you can install some other browser and you can try to uh, browse, the, browse the KML files with another browser. But so far, I wish I could use some open source virtual Earth software to, instead of Google Earth, but so far I didn't find appropriate uh, substitution. And so I don't know why, but uh, Looks like there's not, not many groups in the world developing open source virtual Earths. And so there are a few smaller applications, but there's nothing like that can be compared to Google Earth. So I do use Google Earth and I do uh, use it in my office and I also, we also use it when we do presentations. Uh, but there are some limitations, of course, you know about Google products, so there are some limitations. They're usually written in very small letters. So you have to put glasses, so you have to call a lawyer that has a good glasses. Uh, so you have to be careful about it. But nevertheless, I still think they have, a, they, they, they have the whole list of what they call a geo guidelines. So that's a guidelines for geo data, how to use uh, Google's geo data. And uh, so if you are in academia and doing research, I don't think it should be a problem. But some, for example, I send a paper to PLOS One journal and I had some plots in with Google Earth, and they said no, we cannot accept it because of the uh, we uh, um, we check the Google policies, and that doesn't fit us. So you have to either use some other data source or remove that images. So I had to remove the uh, plots I made in Google Earth. Okay. This this journal, for example, didn't request that. Um, I also put sometimes on Wikipedia some. Uh, you know, you have a Wikimedia Commons, so a place where we put all the images. So I put, uh, I put few Google, uh, Google Earth plots, and then for few they said you have to remove, for the others they didn't say. So there's also a gray, gray area. Uh, so you, you know how it goes in law. As long as you have enough money to pay enough lawyers, you can always sue everyone for everything. Yeah, so there's always a, a bit of a gray area. Nevertheless, what's important to emphasize is that the KML, the, the, the schema, is uh, it's not owned by Google Earth, I mean the Google company. Um, so it's actually controlled by the Open Geospatial Consortium, OGC. And so that's a good news for us, and that's why I also like to develop things for KML. Um, because imagine like this, the, if, if Google was the owner of the schema, and if they had full foot on the schema, then if I make a package that does some things, and then they change the schema, they change some settings, then all the files wouldn't work. So all the files you will create, they wouldn't work anymore. Or if they decide to commercialize it or change the rules, they say, okay, if you want to use these files, then you have to pay extra license, then it will also be a problem. But in this case, all the KML files you produce with the plot KML, you don't have to worry about it, so they are all they will always uh, be mainly controlled by the OGC, so what happens to them. So, so it's like uh, many other uh, open standards. So basically, yeah, it's open, open schema. 
So that's good news for us. Uh, this is an example of a KML. This is this will be a place mark. Um, so like a, just a, a point. Um, and so what what you have here is a um, spatial location of the point. You see it has to be um, so that this one is the um, x x y z. So the uh, elevation has to be also defined. It has to be provided, otherwise you don't follow the schema. And uh, there's also the timestamp, and you see timestamp has a begin and end. So it's kind of also, you can call it a temporal support for that uh, place mark. And you see that's actually, uh, it goes from uh, one, one day, uh, it's a one hour, I think. One hour temporal support, right? So from f uh, five to six o'clock. And you can also insert a name. Th that's actually a meteorological station in Croatia. When you look at the KML reference, then you can see there's lots of, of this. Um, uh, so in the XML, you have these tag names, and, and, uh, or, or you can also call them fields. Uh, so there are lots of these possibilities. So um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I mean, there's, there's a whole book about KML. And actually, I was so surprised how many things you can do in KML, although they're not examples. I mean, it's like if I tell you, you can visualize a regression plot in Google Earth. You know, there are no examples. You won't find them online. But I'm pretty sure you can do it because you can make three-dimensional points. You can put a line through the points, and you can put a frame. So I know you can do it. And so, it, and that's all, all thanks to the diversity of possibilities that you can do via KML. So KML is a is an excellent platform. It has a lots of possibilities, but uh, it's been let's say it's been a bit underused. So you know, people don't use it, for example, for scientific visualization. All of this might change. Um, most importantly, for when you come to geographical objects, you can visualize without a problem. Of course, points, lines, polygons. Then they have what they call ground overlays. So these are the draped uh, draped uh, images which can be uh, usually a JPEG or PNG. Uh, you can also do photo overlays and you can make 3D models. There's an additional uh, language or schema, which is called Colada, and this allows you to make even, um, so when you look in Google Earth, when you see all these buildings that are digitizing and things, they, these are based on Colada. That's a, that's a schema used in Google SketchUp. And I also played a bit with Colada, but there's, there's, this is also another universe. So there are also so many possibilities going there. Um, it's just then you, you have to code much more because there's, there's many more graphical elements. So Colada will mean uh, you can not only make up, uh, for example, a cube in a space, but you can also drape it and you can put transparencies and, and you can play with lots of graphical parameters, okay? Uh, so that, that makes it uh, uh, even more complex. So at the moment, I have only one or two functions that produce also Colada type of uh, uh, files, uh, while 90% 90, 90 of my code is focuses only on the KML, so only on making the KML code. Oh yeah, what's also important about KML is that you can um, specify the style you can specify it separately, and then you have an ID for the style, and then you just call that ID to multiple elements. So that also works. Or you can have each element having a unique style. So, so there, there are also one-to-one -one or one-to-many possibilities considering the styling and the content. I, as I said, I'm a big fan of, of Google Earth. Uh, so why do I like Google Earth? So officially, they do have they are the biggest uh, geographical data browser, browser in the world. Uh, they claim they already have over one billion downloads. Um, it's one of the most used OGC standards also. So lots of organizations, especially research organizations, they have accepted it. Uh, so for example, if you go to GBIF, who is working with GBIF data? Yeah, so if you go to GBIF and then you, you search some data and then you say, well, I want to download the, the records and usually we'll get a CSV or KML. So that, you know, this thing that you see a KML, it means that the, the KML schema and the data format has been well accepted by many research organizations. 
and, and many government agencies. So, so it's becoming really a, accepted as a standard. Um, then when you have Google Earth, you get all this, uh, you get this data that Google purchased or financed. Um, and you can directly go and do some validation. So you not only go and you know, do analysis, you can do analysis and you can do validation and you can do interpretation, etc. So, and it's kind of, a, for me, it's a very iterative process because I, I start with the data, I look at the data, then I fit the model, then I look at the output of the model, then I go back and I revise my model, then I refit and so on. And it really helps me, enhances my process of spatial data analysis. And also, I have to tell a story about Google Earth that when I went in uh, in '98, I went to the Netherlands to do a PhD. And I, my mom asked me, "So, what is your PhD about?" And I said, "I'll be doing lots of uh, GIS." And she says, "What is GIS?" And she says, "Geographical Information System." And I says, "Whatever, some deep science." Then I went and did a PhD. I came back and I saw my mom got the computer, and then. Uh, we were talking something, and then she wanted to tell me where something I was traveling, and, and then she opened the Google Earth, and I said, hey, you know how to use this? I said, yeah, yeah, it's Google Earth, of course. I said, yeah, that's GIS. Ah, that's GIS. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so it kind of Google managed to teach my mom much faster what GIS is than I could do myself. And so uh, it is really, it is a really, it, it, it's a big success. Uh, software and, and it popularizes uh, geographical uh, data, geographical phenomena. It is also uh, becoming Google Maps and Google Earth are becoming kind of an uno unofficial uh, reference. You know, when you go to a new place, where do you look for us? You know, we say, well, I want to see where the place is. I want to see where, how distance are the streets, how distance is this institute from hotel? Where do all we go for us? What is our ultimate references? is the Google, Google system for geographical data. So that's Google Maps or Google Earth. Uh, also now, what some journals are also switching uh, to having, the, especially Elsevier, they're switching to what they call interactive uh, articles. Uh, and so they're recommending that you, know, you do some analysis and you get results and you get uh, uh, tables and you get some graphs and you fit some models, and, and then they say, well, okay, if you submit your paper, you can also submit a view on your data as a KML file. And we can even put, they can even put it in an embedded browser, so when, once you, you get kind of these interactive maps. And so you can zoom in into map, and you can click on the thing. And finally enough, what I discovered, now that I know enough about KML, what I discovered, and I've, I told also my director that, that my prediction is that in a few years, you, we will be able to do a project where we, there's somebody requests that we produce some geodata and do some analysis and produce maps. And then the only thing that we will have to deliver as the project output is a one KML file, which will be about one kilobyte. Okay? And this KML file, somebody will just click on it, and you will see the maps, you will see the report, you could see a video, you could see, read the text, you could rotate the data, you could turn layers on and off, etc. So it will, I think you will, uh, many, many people will probably see that as a huge opportunity because it's, uh, it will be very small size, it's a self-explanatory, and you get the whole package. So you put the whole project, you put in a one KML file. Okay, when you, ma when you manage to make something like this, please send us around, okay? As soon as you say, okay, I made that. You know, you can make also slides. You can make slideshows in Google Earth. Yeah, it's a, it's a HTML compatible, so you can embed uh, kind of slides. And so, and you can, uh, you can record, and then you, uh, when somebody opens a KML file, so just presses, okay, play. And then you can hear multimedia. You can see uh, some, you know, camera zooming into some area. And said, so because of that, we have to do this, and then, you know, imagine like if it's a climate change modeling or something, and then the layers will be turned on and off, and so you can build up the whole story. It's, you can make a st storytelling with the uh, KML, but like scientific so storytelling. I haven't made that yet, so if you made it bef uh, before me, please send it, send it over, okay? Okay, what we look in Google Earth is usually a geographical data, 
Uh, so what does it mean geographical data? So geographical data is data that has a uh, spatial or, or, or space-time reference. So uh, as you know, in Google Earth, there's no coordinate, coordinate system, so there's only uh, the referent uh, VGS84 uh, coordinates, so they are geographical coordinates defined by longitude and longitude. And there is also what they call altitude, so that's a height above uh, ground surface. Uh, altitude, I'm mentioning altitude because this is the key, key uh, KML uh, specification of the uh, height above the ground surface. Um, then we have the time on measurement, and then there's the spatial temporal support. And spatial temporal support, you have to split it usually in space and time. So in space, it will be a size of the block, which is usually two-dimensional or it's three-dimensional. And then you have this temporal support. Uh, so that's the beginning time of uh, measurement. Uh, I think you worked this, uh, uh, with, you, you work with this yesterday with Ezer. So uh, where we live is a space-time cube. That's how reality, and it's a simplified, so we take one dimension, we, you take the third dimension out, and you also flatten it because uh, we can, let's say, just, just for this lesson, simplify, and then when you do measurements, um, you, can, you can also visualize them like this. So if you, if you measure the same thing on the, so meteorological stations, they do measurements in the same location through time, and then if you visualize all the measurements, then you get the space-time cube. And so if you have a, usually a space-time object is a, in an order of magnitude bigger than a purely spatial object. If you, if you just have a spatial object, because if you do repetitions, you know, you do 100 repetitions, then you multiply by 150 points, and so you have a lot of, you have 15,000 measurements. So space-time cube gets really uh, filled in, usually with a lot of measurements. So if you imagine this space-time cube, then, then the size of the volume of, of the, uh, size of the, uh, or the volume to which uh, the measurements referred to is called a spatial temporal support, and it has a two parts. There's the spatial support and there's the temporal support. So that's the vertical or the horizontal uh, size of these cubes. So uh, what we usually deal in, uh, in GIS and in R, in Google Earth, uh, we, you, we deal with uh, some combination of um, having a, a point type objects or regular, irregular. So we can have a point or volumes, and the volumes can be regular, irregular. And we can work with a 2D, 3D, 2D plus time, or 3D plus time. That's what we usually work with. There's a one missing here that's maybe, maybe 1D plus time, but I, I think it's really, I don't know if somebody's working with that. Um, so so that, that's kind of a uh, general setup, uh, what we work with, and then you have, based on, this, based on these aspects, you have different types of uh, spatial and spatial temporal objects. So if you, if you work in 2D uh, dimensions and you, you work with the point objects, then you have spatial points. And so these are the classes, this thing in this uh, font, they are the existing classes in R. And so you see most of, most of combinations are covered, except when you come to do 3D plus time. Uh, so if you look at uh, points, then we have kind of profiles. And then if you, if you have them in time, then so that's kind of time series of profiles. And so that's the data set you got for the spatial prediction competition. So you get a time series of profiles. And as far as I know, there is no uh, official class in R for that. So you have to you have to like experiment. It's a really it's a really pushing the spatial temporal data analysis a bit further. And so this class doesn't exist. Also, if you work with a regular, so then if you go in 2D, you have a, just a pixel. Then in 3D, you have a voxel. And then if you have a 3D plus time, you have a time series of voxels. And also this thing, I'm not sure if it exists. In R, I think you can do 3D spatial pixels, and then you can make time series of 3D spatial pixels. But may maybe I still think that's something that has to be uh, developed. Also, just to, when you look at voxels, there, there's no really class for voxels in R, as far as I know. So there's no, 
class, although uh, Ezer will say, well, you can do in SP, you, if you make spatial pixels, you can make them three-dimensional. Um, but I said, you know, but then maybe you should call it spatial voxels, you know, otherwise it's confusing. Um, so I, w I will still say that it's not something which is uh, available or, or, or well-developed. Uh, funnily enough, there is actually, from all these classes that you see, there's only, actually, there's only one generic class. Uh, and which is that on this plot? Which is the only generic class? And all the other classes are actually just special cases of that class. So which is the class on this plot, which is the only generic class? So all the other classes, actually, the, you can f forget about them as long as you can define that class, then you can derive all other classes. Yes, that's correct. So basically, that's the only generic. So if you imagine um, everything can be put in this format, and then by reducing complexity, you finish, in, you finish all the way up to here. So if you fi first you take the time out, then you have only uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, prisms. So these are called irregular voxels, so prisms. So if you re remove time, then if you introduce regularity, then you have, uh, no, sorry. So if you remove time, then you have irregular voxels, so prisms. Then if you reduce irregularity, then you have voxels. Then if you remove depth, then you have pixels. And if you take out the, the support, then you have points. Can you see that? So I was thinking that actually somebody should redesign SP or space-time, whatever, to just work with this and then derive all these other things as a special case. And also uh, make a geostatistical functionality that works only with this and then all the other things will be special cases. So that will be a reverse engineering of uh, spatial data analysis in R. But yeah, I don't know who's going to do that. Maybe some of you can volunteer. And you definitely need a mathematician because there's a bit of different mathematics, right? If you have irregular um, three-dimensional plus time structures and then you have to do um, resampling, reprojecting, overlaying, aggregating. So you have to develop all these things to work with something like this. And what makes it extra complex is this could be objects which are uh, touching each other, but they could be also objects that, which are overlapping. And then makes it even more complicated. Can you imagine that? So if you have if you have pixels, usually we define them as like uh, um, next to each other. But they could be also a bit over, if you have irregular structure, you can also imagine, okay, they could be exactly um, touching each other, but they could also be a bit overlapping. And to extend it even, make it even more complicated, it could be fuzzy objects. So they could be not with the distinct boundaries, but they could also be fuzzy objects that overlap and they have irregular structures. So if somebody will make a, a mathematics for that, for this type of object, then the problem is solved. Yeah, maybe it won't happen even in next 10 years, I don't know. So we'll see. So that's just what I wrote. So there's an irregular voxel prism. And if you regularize it, then you have, so you just chop the irregular parts, then you get the voxel, and then you from voxel you reduce the depth dimension and you get a grid cell or pixel. Okay, we, I don't have any examples with prisms, so don't worry about that. And I have some examples with voxels, but nevertheless it's good to start just, you know, thinking about the whole process. Um, also, if you play with the uh, altitude, you can define negative altitude in Google Earth, funnily enough. In KML, you can define it, but if you visualize it, it's, it, it, uh, I'm not sure now what do they do now. Is, is it not shown or they just still, uh, if it's minus, then they put it on the surface. So there's no below surface Google Earth. There is below sea level, uh, below uh, sea surface Google Earth. You know, there's the uh, Google Earth, what's, what was the name? Google Ocean or something? And so, so you can you can swim into the ocean. You can dive and you can explore the the uh, surface, uh, the sea bottom, right? Have you ever played with that? So you can do that. So, but I I would guess also Google might go in a direction where they will 
allow also people to look at geological structure and go to underground. So it's kind of Google, Google Earth underground. Um, so, you know, Google Earth is maybe has some limitations. And also R has a limitation. It's, it's not really, uh, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone uh, to do, to vi first, if you go to SP plot and you want to vi plot some big map, like a normal map that you work with, um, I think this SP plot uses this uh, polygon plotting technology. So every pixel is plotted as a polygon and you easily go and wait for like 20 minutes, you know, just to get like a thousand by thousand pixel image. Uh, so it's not something I will recommend. And also there's a very little interactivity. I mean, R was never designed for visualization, although there are some interactive visualization packages, the books on interactive visualization, but still I wouldn't recommend it. So we have these two things, two software, which, which have very strong points, uh, but they also have uh, drawbacks. And so that's why I wanted to develop a package that uses both strong points of Google Earth, strong points of R, and so uh, you do analysis in R and you do interactive visualization in Google Earth. Uh, there are also differences. Uh, so, for example, the key difference between KML and Google Earth and, and R is that you, now you have all this diversity. You can do, you can organize, as you saw in the course, you can organize raster data. You have, can have them in a raster package or you can have a SP package. Uh, there's probably other uh, classes for um, raster data, so you can organize your data in different ways, and diversity is good. While in KML, uh, you have a single convention, and that's also very nice. It's very nice to have a single convention because, for example, uh, they say the Google Earth killed cartography. <laughs> All these things like projection system, eh? we don't need it. So they just re remove the cartography. It is, uh, when, you, when you open Google Earth and when you look at uh, uh, something in Google Earth, that is still cartography, and they, you still look at the projection. Of course you look at the projection because it's on a flat screen, right? And which projection are we looking at? What's the projection? Hmm? So when we use Google Maps, we look at one projection, and we look at Google Earth, we look at the other projection because we see, we, we, we see image on a screen. So which projection is it in Google Maps? Kind of Mercator projection, they have some Google Mercator projection. I think uh, Robert Hymans was talking about that on uh, Tuesday, oh no, on, on Monday, sorry. Uh, and which projection do we get when we look at Google Earth? Hmm? You never thought about this. No, it's not projection. No, no, it's a projection because you get it on a flat screen. So it's the same projection that you have in a camera, right? It's a, a stereoscopic projection. I don't know how it's called. So it just projects a three-dimensional object to a, a flat screen through a, a one focus point. So it, that's also, it's also in a way, it's a, it's a projection system. Okay? But you get this impression of seeing three-dimensional object. Okay, so it's a, it's a three-dimensional, it creates an illusion of three-dimensional uh, objects. Okay, something about time. Uh, also time is uh, dealt with in KML, which is also a good thing. Um, it's dealt only in one way, so it's, uh, there's the UTC uh, time, and, and this time is also in in R, I think if you work with time, then you will finish also working with this POSIX CT and uh, POSIX uh, T classes. And so what it has, it has this, um, it has of course a year, month, uh, day or day, month. Um, and then there are the hours and minutes and seconds, and then there's the time zone. So that, that's what, nobody goes usually beyond seconds. So there's no need to go, but maybe there will be also applications in the future where we'll, you will want to know what happens in a split of second. Um, so yeah, and then this thing, first thing about the time zone is uh, um, if you forget about time zone and if you do some <laughs> global project, it, you will have a problem. 
if you forget it, because uh, different countries might have the same time, local time, but it's a different time zone. Huh? And then the you know Superman wants to uh, go to to the past, and so if you if you now know that the, um, for example, uh, 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 let's say United States, they're in the past, right? They will be in uh, they will have two o'clock in about I don't know four or five hours. So they live in past, right? So it's very simple. You just fly to the New York and, and beyond, and you fly faster, and then you just go in more, more and more in the past. And that's what they do in this Superman movie. That's what he does. He just flies. And but then the, whoever under, understands a, at least a bit of physics and concept of time, then actually we all live in the same time. I mean, there's, the time zones are illusions. We create them for practical purposes. But there's only one time that's the universal universal time. There's also the, the other thing is the concept of the, you know, we have our Jesus time. So we are in the year 2014. So we never agreed on that. I mean, there was no political discussion, just religion imposed it and they imposed it also to other religions. And so I said, this is the time, 2014 years from Jesus' birth. But there's also the computer Jesus. You know, the computer Jesus, when I don't know, maybe in 20 years, some intelligent robots, they will also talk about their Jesus time. You know, what's, when is the Jesus, computer Jesus time? Hmm? So 1st of January 1970, that's their zero time. And so if you, if you look at this, if I go to my R session, oh, let's see. And so if I do, so that's, that's, that's exactly now, right? That's the system time. But I can also look at that system time in uh, computer Jesus time. So I say on class, and then I get this thing. So that's the computer Jesus time. So these are the seconds from the first second of 1970, 1st of uh, January. It's a big number because it's in seconds. But you can check it. I mean, if you divide it by, by 60, by 60, by 24, and then by 12, I don't know. And then you can check that you will get, that you, you will see that it's, uh, well, actually, I could also calculate that. I think if I do, if I just do minus, and if I say, um, let me try this. This might not work. So I have to make this uh, as date or something before I can compute. I have to get from date. Uh, Uh, what was it? Um, CT. Oh okay, yeah, let's try this. So I have it. Uh, first, I get to the date, and then this should work. Ah, okay. So I get a difference in days, unfortunately. But I, I could play a bit, and I can, I can, I could prove it to you that I get exactly the same if I do one class. Yeah. So, but you you see, you can calculate in R with with time. I mean, you can calculate the, the time difference, and time difference can be then reported in in different units. I mean, it can be seconds or days or months or something. So you can all this thing is available, of course, in R, and there are packages only to deal with time. Okay, but when you come to Google Earth, then you only when you come to writing KML, then you have to also convert your time to something like this. So that's the uh, XML schema for time. So all the time, even if you just know the day or if you just know the year, it has to be converted to this format before you can write it to KML. But this is what my package does. So I force it, you know, you give me, you give me a time, it has to be a POSIX uh, CT class, 
and then I will force that it's in this format. And otherwise, I know that KML uh, will uh, have problems. Okay, but then KML schema, they might decide to change something or they might decide to have more flexibility, but I doubt that they will uh, drop the UTC. So it will always stay uh, UTC. And that's the time in Greenwich. Again, it was never politically discussed. It was just they decided and they went through. So Greenwich is the center of the world. Okay, so when I started making the plot KML package, I was more interested. This is a very interesting story. When I started making plot KML, I was more interested in uh, uh, templates, in how, uh, what I want to visualize and how. And then my colleague Pierre, he told me actually that if you want to make a um, state of the art R package, you have to make a package that works with uh, classes and, and, and it's based on methods. So he says, you have to look at the classes. That's, that's really where you have to start. If you want to design a package properly, you have to look at the classes and then you have to go per class and develop functionality. And that's called object-based programming and, that, and, and many, many people developing in R, they really uh, highly recommend it also that you uh, uh, tr uh, try to develop things via the classes. And the latest implementation of classes in R is called, how is it called? S4, so that's the four, fourth generation of S classes, something like that. And so I, I, then I took some steps back and I already had functionality to write KML files, but I never, I never program via classes. I would just, you know, say, well, give me uh, some data frame or something. And then, and then I started looking at the classes and then we started making f functions to work class by class. So we started with points, of course, um, and then, in the meantime, Edzer made the space-time package, so there were all these uh, space-time classes, and so, okay, how do we write then the space-time classes? Space-time classes can be, you know, this uh, um, irregular data frame, full data frame, uh, what was it, it's like four or five. They're a bit abstract for some people. It will take time until we get used to. And there's also irregular trajectory space-time, whatever. Or, or there's a space-time trajectory class now. Uh, so, so then we also extended to that, and there are also some soil profile classes, and there's also raster package has classes. So we try to pick up about 70% of what we know that people use commonly in GIS, people doing GIS analysis in R, and we try to implement that. And we also kind of split up. Also at the beginning, I made just, you know, if I say I wanted to write point data with my one function to write point data in KML, and then Pierre said, no, it's better to split, it's better to program in a, so you have a, 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 pro, a scale programming, so you have a low-lying functions, and then you wrap them, then you have like a in-between something, and then you have the real wrapper functions. So then I also reprogram everything, and now we have also this, um, so these are medium-level functions, and it allows you to create your own templates. You can use this function to create your own visualizations. So, uh, so this is basically what we made is a kind of a platform for anyone to go and says, well, I, I like your template. A template is, you know, one type of visualization. Um, and so we like your templates or views on the data, but I want to create my own view. And then you can go and you can, you can use this, what we call KML building utilities. So you can, you can make a really quickly a function where you says, okay, I want to have for example, imagine like this, you say, I want to have a, a, a raster image and I want to have a polygon map overlay. I always have this type of data. And then you can make a small function which will go and say, open KML, then put, put a raster, then put polygons on it, put transparency, then close it and zip it. You see, so you can make your own uh, types of views. So the, I think it's now quite flexible. You can also play with the um, what what uh, Pierre called aesthetics, so that's kind of graphical parameters. So you can uh, send things to, um, so you can choose different uh, variables and to that you want to display via color or via shape, etc. So we will be playing with all these things, and you will see what are all the advantages. So the way to also quickly see what PlotKML can do now. So the so these are the existing views. 
So you can, so as I said, you can make your own views, but if you don't want to make your own views, you want to just use views that I created already, then you can go to the ga gallery. Uh, so let me look at the gallery. So here on the home page of the plotkml, you can see there's a gallery and you can say, well, okay, let me look. So I'm looking at this, let me open that file. So here's a one example of the view. And so first you can open a KML file and you look at you look at the visualization type and then you say, well, okay, I want to prepare the same thing with my data and then you have to go and look at the code. So, so that's how most of the people, I think, start using uh, plot KML uh, by first looking at the, uh, some existing gallery. Um, now tell me, how many aesthetics parameters you see here? So this is the same content at soul profiles. How many aesthetics parameters do you see here? Maybe I should get the lights a bit down. Let me see. Lights. Okay, front. We do off. Yeah, this is better, right? Except it's a bit too much. Um, so how many aesthetics parameters do you see here? The colors, the colors okay. Four. Then? Five. Four or five. No, actually there are three, but if you maybe see more, you can see that the, the the, as the values, uh, uh, smaller values have a smaller elevation, and then higher values have a higher elevation, right? And then there's also the text. The text also tells you if the value is higher or smaller. But the size of the balloon is the same. So the size has been taken out, color has been uh, put, so going from blue to red, and we have the uh, altitude, and we have the text. So there are three aesthetics parameters. And why do I use three aesthetics parameters to display the same thing? Why would I use that? Well, I don't know. It's, I'm not really also a professional cartographer. As I said, I have a background in cartography. But some, sometimes if you want to emphasize something, you know, if you want to emphasize in a text some word, then you put it bold. But if you put it bold and underlined, then it's even more emphasized. Or if you put it bold and red, then it's, you know, people like really pick it up quickly. So if you want to really emphasize some differences, then it's, it can be done by, uh, it can be emphasized by adding uh, more uh, aesthetics parameters. So how was this uh, plot produced? So we can look at the example. So here's the example. And so if I will just run this code, I will get the same plot. And there's few other, uh, few other possibilities that you can do here. So let me try this. I'll just switch to some uh, TMP directory. So I can copy paste this and And just load the data. Uh, so uh, this is a point data set, right? Ebergotzen is a soil mapping data set. And there's a sand, silt, and clay, and soil type at the locations. Um, it's a bit big data set, so I can actually reduce it to 5% because there's um, 3,000 points. Um, and then I can produce a a simple, a si simple plot. So let me start with a very simple plot. Um, so that's that's a very simple plot. So that here I just put a cross, 
I put a cross and I put that, uh, the value. So that's something you do very commonly in, uh, for example, in geostatistics. You want to just show uh, which value was, what is the sample value, right? So that's just, a, you know, so starting with, with, very, with a single uh, aesthetics plot. Then I can say, okay, instead of the cross, I want to use some Google icon. So I, I have to define where this icon is. So I say shape is there. And I said, uh, plot this object. Well, this is actually, th this function is, is a, a smaller version of plot KML because this one only does, this is only for writing KML, okay? And then the plot KML is, is above that, so it will also, it will write it and it can also compress it and plot it. So this is just to write it. So I can say here now, okay, I want to add a shape, sh use this shape. I want to display a silk content and I want to use some, um, I want to use some default uh, color legend. I use the Saga, by, by the way, I use the Saga uh, palettes often. And then let's take a look at this. So that's the one. This is the one that we saw uh, here. So you see, this is now just the, so I have the, I'm using a new icon and I've put the colors. Yes, question? Um, can you show how you got that code? Okay. We will run in the second block, we'll go, I'm going maybe, you know, just up and down. Uh, so I will also, we will go through the whole tutorial. So if you go to the plot KML homepage, so welcome to the plot KML project. Then if you go down to the gallery, you see for each uh, image in the gallery, you have two things. You have the KML file, so you just, you don't want to create the KML file, you just want to see how it looks like. If, if this is something I want. And then you have the example, which is basically it's a package documentation. And then on the bottom of that, you have the example with the Ebergots and data set that's in Germany. Okay, then you can copy paste it. You have to load, you have to install and load plot KML, of course. Um, this, so this was first one was only using, uh, first I only used the numbers. Then I said, okay, I want to replace the icon and I want to color, put the colors. And then I can also say, well, I want to re, uh, use the icon and I want to use the colors and I want the labels. Then I got this one. So now it's, and I use the size. No, sorry, I don't use the labels, but I use the size. So this is kind of like a bubble plot. Bubble plot in, in uh, uh, you know, when you do a bubble in the SP package, you get about a similar thing. Okay, so you can see where the, again, you have two aesthetics parameters. So you can see that where the values are high and where they are low. Oh yeah, you can also put, oh, maybe I skipped that too fast. Here you can put one sole property you use for the size and the other you use for the color. So you have a multivariate visualization. So actually what we're looking for here is, um, I think, so the um, uh, clay, clay is the color, right? I'm not sure. No, silt is the color and clay is the size. So these areas are areas with a high clay and the um, red areas are the areas with the high silt. You can see that the two are uh, negatively correlated. So where you have a high clay, you have a low or medium silt. So they are, they are negatively, and of course they're negatively correlated because you're not, so texture, there's this, it's a tr uh, three part variable. So there's three variate variable and the uh, sum of uh, uh, seal, clay and sand, they have to, it has to be 100%. So where you have a high clay, of course you can have a high silt. But there are situations where you can have a bit higher clay and bit higher silt, that's possible. But then the sand is very small. Okay, so, so, so with plot KML you can also play with these multivariate visualizations. 
And here's the last example. So here I also say I want to compress it, so make me a KMZ file. KML files are not really efficient. I mean, they are human readable, and it's just like a text. Okay, so if I have 3,000 points, I mean, it has to make all these tags and everything. So the file goes like, blows up. And that's why you can also choose an option KMZ is true. So then it will create a KMZ file. And you can see that the compression is often like 97%. It's so you only get a 3% of the original file size. So now the only catch is when I want to visualize, now it will work also. So, so this is the one that, that is actually on the, on the website. And here you have, as I said, I decided to use the three aesthetics parameters. And all these things what I did, so all this thing that you, when you do with the KML, a much faster way to get there is just to say plot KML, and I say Eberg, and then I just have to pick up a, a property that I want to visualize. So let's say that's the silt in, in the first layer. So you see, I could, I could get much faster um, directly to Google Earth if I just use a plot KML. So I don't have to specify the aesthetics and I don't have to open the file. So that's, that's kind of, it's a bit of wrapper function. The problem is if you don't like, if you don't like uh, my views, then you have a problem. I say, well, I don't want to have the colors and the size and so on. So I say, I want my own view. Then you have to, you have to make your own, you have to make your own functions. So then you will go and say, uh, uh, plot my points function, and you say, for every object I send, uh, do a KML open, write a KML layer with this aesthetics, close the KML layer, then you can also put a logo, you can put a, a text or metadata, whatever, then you close the KML, and then you say visualize. And then you write your function, and then you can run it with any type of uh, data that you have. So it's a customized KML plotting function. Okay, let's make a break. Uh, is it now time to forget? No, it's three o'clock. It's three o'clock, okay, so I can still continue, good. I see everybody's clicking, so I think you're already uh, working with KML. Um, so as I said, I can I can work with the, on a so it's a, a scalable package. So you can work with the lower level functions. Uh, you can use the KML function, which is just to produce KML files, and you can use a, a plot KML function, which is the ultimate wrapper function. And most of the tutorials I do, they are based on just doing plot KML. Okay, in a plot KML, you can also later and you can add as a as an argument. You can say, well, I don't want the these colors, so I won't, don't want the default color, so I want to turn off the size of the bubble or something like that. So you can do the also via the plot KML, but there's a good practice is if you, if you just want to generate uh, your own templates, the best thing is to make your own function, so KML plotting function. And you can call it however you like, and you just call all these uh, uh, KML um, utilities, and then you can make your own functions. That will be my recommendation to you. Uh, be very careful when you work with plot KML. It's, as I said, first KML is not uh, efficient for storing big data. It was never imagined actually as a as a data format. So it's not that you know if you have um, you know polygons from a country and something. I said I want to send you the polygons and I'll save it as a KML file and send it. So you can do that, but it's that it's a bit silly idea. So. It was never meant to be a, a data exchange format. So that's not really the idea, but um, you, can, you can also read KML files. You can read them to R, and you can get uh, GIS type of objects back. So that's possible. The way to go around this uh, working with the big uh, objects, plotting big objects, is to tile. So you can tile, and then you can write multiple KML files, and then you have to make a one wrapper KML file, which says, if I open up 
uh, my Google Earth here, then just open this tile. If I open it here, then open tile. It's called a kind of indexing technology, and this is what the Google Earth is also based on. Google Earth, Google Maps, they're based on this uh, multi-scale indexing technology. So you only, you only uh, fetch uh, where you look at. And if you look at the whole world, then you get only generalized scale. Yeah, you know, in Google Earth, there's a, uh, in Google Maps, I think there's 19 scales. And uh, if you go to the most detailed scale, it's a, hu it's a huge, it's a huge data set, but then if you go to the most general scale, it's actually very small. Okay? You wanted to ask a question? Yeah, so, so can you give a number, like what is large? When, when do the problems start? Uh, well, that, yeah, that's a fuzzy term, so there's no strict number. Um, what you have in, in Google Earth and Google Maps, I think the rasters are 300 by 300 pixels. That's a one tile, something like 256 by 256. So that, that can be considered, you know, uh, uh, a, a small object, so no problem. But once you go beyond that, like let's say two or three times beyond that, then you are, let's say, talking with a uh, large raster. But, you know, technology also changes. You know, we used to have uh, photo cameras that will take, I don't know, maybe 1,000 pixels wide uh, picture. Now you have cameras which take 10,000 pixels wide picture, you know. So this is also changing. We had satellite images that were one kilometer resolution. Now we have s satellite images which are like uh, one meter or less than one meter. There's even, you know, they have these companies, they have video, they made video recordings. They can record you going in a car. You, you, can, you can always, you know, the commercial companies, we can say, I want in that time, town in Germany, I want a video recording of that street and everything that happens there. And you can order it already now. So, so the technology is also changing. This is towards the scientific plotting. So I work with the soil data and I want to see how the values change through the depth. And then I made this uh, functionality to do plotting of soil profile collections. So that's a class in, in R made by uh, Dylan, Dylan Baudet. And so you can see how this looks like. Here we have about high 500 points, okay? And these points are also somewhere in nature. And that's a, it's, a, it's a bit also difficult to start and get used to this. Um, it's also interactive. Can, I can click on different points and I can get uh, different soil properties. Um, but this one is, a, I think it's base saturation. So this shows me how the base saturation changes with depth. And I can even see the actual depth, so that's 10, uh, 10 centimeters, 20, 30. So this, this thing has been measured only up to 50 centimeters, and I can see that the first layer has a bit higher base saturation, and then it drops, but then it grows again. And I can see the actual numbers. So that's the... Uh, um, so it's, I think it's this one, 8.2, that's 9. So I can see also the actual numbers. So that's kind of... a uh, soil depth curve plotted in Google Earth. If I zoom in uh, more, then I can see that there there's many of these uh, soil profiles taken here, so that's somewhere in California. There are also ones which are taken in the plain area. And I can also visualize a few of them, maybe a bit next to each other. So I'm looking how the things change. These, I think, two profiles next to each other. So I can see how the things change. Okay, so that's a bit more towards the scientific visualization. Have you ever used the Google Earth uh, uh, PlotKML before? Or is it now the first time? Who used it before? Okay. So I should be a bit more gentle, right? I shouldn't jump too, much, too fast into things. So this is just about the soil data. You can also, I mean, the really sky is the limit with the uh, Google Earth. 
So um, you can have a, also photograph in Google Earth. And so what nice thing about having a photograph is that you, you look at the landscape and you look at the, so we look at the soil photograph, right? But we, we see in which landscape it, this soil comes. So you can make kind of a, a virtual gallery. <laughs> Uh, and you could also, if you will take some vegetation photograph and you have a, like if you follow up a, um, a catena, like a cross section, and you take photographs and like you go, okay, going from a plane, f climbing to the top of the hill, and you see how the vegetate the succession of vegetation. So you will take like multiple photographs and then you can make like a panels in Google Earth and you can have a virtual walk. So instead of, you know, if you have a, if you're going to do a field work with your students and you say, okay, we have to prepare for the field work, and then you take these pictures and then you just run that field work in the classroom in a virtual, virtual uh, setup and then you explain them everything. So when you go with them to the field work, they will all be mentally prepared what to see. And you can also, you don't, you know, nobody needs a training in Google Earth. You just give them the KML files and you say, play with them. And then the, the you know the kids today they will they find this way. So you don't there's no there's no manual I think needed for Google Earth. They say the best software the best software is the one where there's no user manual. So they say the best. Uh, that's why one of the uh, iPhone is kind of a most popular smartphone. And when you buy iPhone, is somebody using iPhone, iPhone users, yeah. Did you, uh, when you bought the phone, did you get any user manual or something? Well, they do, we can have a little thing. Yeah. So well, I actually, I heard that there is no user manual. I think with the, with the ones there were, and then I kept updating my yeah. iPhone, I didn't really bother to Yeah. It, so. I actually, I heard that now there is no user manual, so uh, they said, no, we did it properly. There's no user manual needed. Um, so, uh, so I think Google is a type of software you also don't, don't have to give training, but if you want to use some, you will see I'm doing some things, I'm rotating and I'm looking, f uh, you know, I'm looking at different uh, things and then I can also, you know, um, turn some things on and off. I can, I can search within a layer. So there are some functionality, which is kind of a primitive GIS functionality. You can also, you know, you can digitize polygons in Google Earth. And you can do things. So there, there's some primitive functionality that has to be, uh, let's say, a bit explained. So we will also try to look at that a bit. Uh, this is where it gets a bit slightly more comprehensive. So um, I also made a lots of functionality for uh, plotting uh, geostatistical models. So this is, so as I said, Google Earth is for me environment for scientific visualization. So not only I can visualize the data, I can also visualize the models. In this case, this is still relatively primitive because what I visualize is just uh, plots as a screen overlays. But I will, I think in future, I, I will visualizing, be visualizing like a variogram. I will visualize it in Google Earth in somewhere in space. So maybe I will put it next to the study area. I will put also variogram like a three-dimensional object. So that's, that's what I expect in which direction the things will go. Um, so this example looks uh, something like this. So here's an example with the spatial predictions. Now that's my second package I made, uh, which is called uh, GCIF. So I load, this is the mass data set. I think you, did you work with mass data set? You, I think uh, Robert had some examples and maybe Edder did also something yesterday. So that's my second package I made. It's called GCIF, Global Soil Information Facilities. That's the, actually the project I'm leading. And so I made a wrapper functions for geostatistical modeling. 
So I will say fit GSTAT model, and I say I have the point data, I have the covariates as rasters, and I have a um, regression uh, relationship I'm looking at. So then I get the regression model, I get the variogram, and I get a um, object of class GSTAT model, and then I can do predictions. So this one runs regression Krieging, uh, produce the predictions. So it's like three steps. Um, feed the model, make the predictions, and visualize. Okay, it's, it's the, supposed to be on a level of uh, automated, maybe you're leaving. Okay, right. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was very nice to meet you, and thanks for right. coming. Uh, we see on, we'll see on other geostat, I'm sure. If not in the United States, then back in Europe. Okay, have a good trip. So this goes very quickly, then we go quickly from uh, having just a, you know, something abstract to looking at this data in, in Google Earth, so we can do all the interpretation. Mm, we, can, we can say, okay, this model is, is fine, it looks good, I mean, the, the, the points are, we are getting close to the, the, the values, so the predictions get close to the values. Right, so it, it enables us to do, to be mappers very quickly. And if I, if I change some small setting, Let's take a look at this. So, so I will say now I don't want to use only uh, linear regression Krieging. I want to use a uh, random forest Krieging. So I will just say change the method to random forest. So let's try that. So now I get a uh, random forest uh, predictions. I can produce uh, random forest screening predictions, and I can again go and visualize it, and then I will get a bit different map. You see the, the, the values a bit slightly different. So then I can play with different models, and I can quickly look and do interpretation. Uh, these are the three standard plots also, it's a my choice. That's the plots I really like to quickly see. So as soon as I do some geostatistics, these are the plots I really quickly like to see. This first plot, it's about regression part. So you can see the observed and predicted. And you can see if, it, if the observed and predicted are kind of on a line, then you know, okay, I, I modeled it properly. I don't have an underestimation, overestimation, and I don't have any skewness or anything. So I can see that the residuals here will be relatively normal. And then this is the variogram of residuals, and this is the original uh, variogram, and this is the global variance. So I can see, okay, I have global variance is about 12, okay? I can see that there's a, a nugget is about uh, five. When I do the residual variogram, the nugget gets smaller, because everything gets pushed, because I explained with random forest quite some variation, and this, is, this red thing, this is the, uh, these are the cross-validation residuals. Now, if my model is correct, then these cross-validation residuals, they should show no spatial dependence. So that's a proof that my uh, cross-validation residuals uh, don't show any bias. So the model reduces all the spatial dependence, I mean, takes all the spatial dependence into account. So that gives me, a, um, uh, gives me confidence to conclude that, okay, my map it's not making any big mistakes. So my predictions that this map I made, it's not making any big, big mistakes. But if I, f if I go further on, and if I look at, for example, I can set up a transparency here. And then if I zoom in, I can, for example, see that I'm predicting, this is a soil organic carbon. And I can see that I'm predicting soil organic carbon also for the pixels where there's water. You see this? And so then I can do quickly interpretation. I know, okay, I have to go back to my data set and I have to define my water mask better. So I don't want to, let's say I finish this map and I send it to someone to make decisions. And then I go, what did you give us? You gave us like soil organic matter in the water. It's nonsense. So this allows me to in in increase the quality of a product. Just to show you this same thing, I can also, if I switch the grid to polygon, so convert all the grids to polygons, 
then if I do a visualization with this, now it will take a bit of time, but I get every pixel I get plotted, every pixel get plotted as a polygon. So then I can also see actual polygon uh, uh, boundaries. So here's the, oh yeah, that's the random forest. This is the random forest uh, prediction. It's a bit funky. Random forest gives every time if you fit it, it gives you a different thing. Hmm? So that's a bit, you have to be careful with that. Um, if I will now go in, let me try that. I will refit it. So a second fit. And then the plot again. And so we'll, we'll probably get a different thing. Yep. Uh, the plotting, plotting in in plot KML doesn't depend on GStat. There's nothing from GStat, but it depends on the SP and space time. So I import from SP and space time. I'm a package compatible with SP, space time, and raster. That's our main dependency. Uh, in the GCIF package, so the geostatistical model fitting and interpolation, I from GStat I only use the Kriging. I only use the Kriging, and that's very interesting because I was a GSTAT user for years, and I always thought, okay, it's the best ge geostatistical software. But now when I actually went to do real projects and do mapping, I discovered actually the regression part is more attractive for me, and it's, I don't think it's dealt in depth in GSTAT, so I use only GSTAT for Kriging the residuals, but I don't use it for the regression part. Yeah, so I have a small dependency, but you have to, like, if you want to look, if you want to really understand what's going on here, because this looks like in some bathroom or something, the, the how do you call them, the, you know, the, the, pla the plates, and then you, so it looks something like that because it, the values go up and down. So, yeah, well, uh, for sure the random forest is more tricky. It's more tricky if you have a, a small data and if you, use only like a one or two covariates and the relationship is not very clear then it can be more tricky so i can i can turn this off let's turn this off and i recompute the model now i just use a linear regression model and then if i replot this then we should get something else So and then we get, uh, I think I have to refresh. I have it now, sometimes Google Earth, when you have uh, local files, then it creates kind of a, a local cache and then it's difficult to see. Uh, did I? Oh, no, sorry, I didn't do the predict. That's the problem. So let's try now. I did, I fitted the model, but I didn't do the uh, re-predict. So now we'll get the... Voila, so this one is with the, so when I take the random forest out, so I just get a linear, linear regression Kriging. And what I like about this uh, visualizing all the pixels is that when you set up the transparency, I can see actually uh, how heterogeneous pixels are. Okay, so I can see here this pixel, this is exactly where it falls. So I can see most of this pixel is water. So you could go and say, well, this pixel has to be taken out. This pixel has to be taken out. This pixel. So, you know, you can do directly interpretation. Okay. I think my dream was, you know, with the plot KML, my dream was to bring you something that you have as a, you just start with a very abstract data. You have an Excel table or something, you have points. And you don't really see patterns there, right? But they actually probably there's lots of patterns. And then you work with the grid also, that's been prepared by some remote sensing instrument, whatever. But then you don't know what is really now relationship between this pixel resolution and 
actual detail, I mean, what's going on here. And my, so my dream was to kind of um, allow people to explore the data like as they were surveyors. Because I'm a surveyor, I have a, I have a degree in surveying. So I wanted to like go back to the field and, you know, do without having to travel there and, you know, look at really and, and, and do, do all these things that the surveyor does, like do lots of interpretation and thinking, okay, what's going on here? So that was my dream, and I don't know how much I uh, managed to make with that, but uh, you will see it does allow you to um, quickly go from something that is abstract uh, to something that you can uh, match with, uh, you know, topography, um, local landscapes, local land use, and so on. Okay, let's make a, a coffee break. And then in the, uh, after the coffee break, we will go and do plot KML step by step, okay? So then I will really slow down and we'll go from uh, example to example. Question? Uh, it's just something to do with the example. My okay. PMC we do that after coffee break? Okay. Okay. Okay, see you in half.